Hello, we're uh, on this series of studies on the book of James, and uh, today we're looking at James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. We've been taking the entire book and sort of breaking it down into different sections, and this is the section that we're going to be looking at today. Let's read these, and then we'll chat them through. Uh, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now, what is interesting about this, again, to make sense of a text like this, it's very easy just to take the verse and then preach on it or teach on it or whatever. But what enriches, and this is the genius of a Bible study like this, what enriches our experience of the Bible is context. Hmm. In other words, when we understand why things are written and to whom they're written and for the purpose that they're written, that it actually helps to bring out the truth of what they say in an even more powerful way. Now, what is interesting is that James begins, submit yourselves then to God. Then he goes on to say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The previous comments that James has made, uh, of which we chatted about, of course, uh, James is talking about how that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Mm. So uh, when he talks about the devil, um, the, he's clearly referring to that as, as as being like the world. I think that that's the kind of roughly the same thing. Mm-hmm. Of course, the devil in James's thinking would be like the the culture setter of the world, the mm-hmm. kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light, those simplistic terms, but they can be helpful in underst- helping us to understand the difference between the culture of the world, which is um, a system that is motivated by the de- demonic, I think James would say, versus the kingdom of God, which of course is a system based on the values of who God is. So he says, and I think this is the reason why he then says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But before that, of course, he insists that we must submit ourselves to God. Mm-hmm. Now, this is interesting. He doesn't just say resist the devil. He says, first submit to God, Mm. then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Would you like to make a comment or two on that? Let's start with you at the moment, Jonah. Yeah, sure. I mean, the reason he talks about submitting to God is that ultimately that's going to come first. It's almost like pick your side. You know, um, submitting in uh, our day-to-day usage, it can sometimes be seen as a bit of a passive word, um, almost like ending our struggle against the values of the world and against the devil and against temptation, whatever it may be, and submitting to the enemy. But that's not what James is talking about. It's much more active. Um, it's uh, it, the context. It's more like he's saying uh, enlist your allegiance mm. to the great commanding officer and, and fight under his banner. That's more what he's talking about. And so inevitably, you know, when you when you enlist to one side, you become a target of the other. And so it's almost like, okay, choose your side, submit to God. And then, okay, now you're going to have something to resist. And so mm. I think that's why it starts with the idea of submission. That's very good. Uh, Dr. John, this idea of resisting the devil then, unpack that for us perhaps a little more. I think what James is trying to get across and important is to get it in the kind of perspective of, uh, of who God is and who the devil is. Mm. And that's why this idea of submitting to God. Because, okay, Satan, um, the devil has some power, some might, but God is almighty. Mm -hmm. Um, Satan was created, God is uncreated and eternal. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing by submitting to God, we're submitting to his love, we're submitting Mm -hmm. to his power Mm -hmm. of someone who is infinitely greater than any of the opposition that we could ever have. Mm -hmm. Um, The Apostle John is saying that um, greater is he in you, uh, that's the Holy Spirit, than he was in the world, Mm -hmm. the kind of spirit uh, of evil, the, Mm -hmm. the, the devil. And I think also getting in mind what Jesus did on the cross. Um, 
we read in Colossians on the cross, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rules and powers of evil. He had the victory over them. And I like this this verse in uh, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, where uh, Paul is writing that God will strengthen his people and keep them safe from Mm. the evil one. Mm. So what we're doing by submitting to God, we're we're acknowledging that God is almighty. He's Mm -hmm. he's on the throne. He's Mm. on the throne. Mm. He's got complete control. And and in doing that, Mm. we have the power of the Holy Spirit Mm. and and we then can resist evil that Mm. comes against us. What's interesting as well about this, the, the, the key is submitting to God. Mm, yeah. And it's not about taking authority, but it's about submitting to authority. Mm. I hear many Christians, and I've, it's language that I have felt uncomfortable with mm, mm. for years. And they say, we take authority mm. over this situation. We take authority over the works of the mm. devil. And I hear the heart and I understand mm. what they're saying. Very often based on these verses, of course, is the reason why people speak like that and so on. I don't see anything about taking authority here. What I do see is, number one, the importance of submitting to authority. Mm. Of course, that's God's authority. And then when it comes to dealing with the devil, I don't see him say, fight the devil. And if James had wanted to use the language of fighting, he could have done. He's used that previously. And James 4 talks about fighting and quarreling amongst the Christians. He does not tell us to fight the devil. Mm. He simply says, resist the devil. Mm -hmm. In other words, resist his influence in your life. Don't fight it. Don't stand up and rebuke the demons and do this and do that and do the other thing. He simply says, submit to God which is by far the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Every time the enemy seeks to come and um, tempt you or m- lure you into the world's value system, resist it. Don't go mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. And eventually, mm-hmm. the promise is that the devil will flee from you. Mm-hmm. He will flee from you. Not because you've been shouting and screaming and rebuking, mm-hmm. but because you are you understand the nature, the true nature of authority, that it's mm-hmm. not about you taking authority, mm-hmm. it's about you submitting to authority. Then resisting by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, the, the, the works of the devil, and then eventually he will flee from you. I think this is very, very powerful and insightful stuff, don't mm-hmm. you think? Absolutely. And that word resist comes from two Greek words, which means to stand and against. So stand against. We must stand against the devil. Well, how? Pastor Roy's just said it. By submitting to God. When I submit to him, it, what does that mean? It means ordering myself under God, mm. to surrender to him as the conquering king. And then I start, I start receiving the benefits of his reign. And, you know, I think you you're right. I think sometimes, um, you know, we can make too much of the the devil's power as well. Like the devil's a defeated foe. He can and will be defeated by those who just simply, you know, stand against him. Mm. We don't need some third party to cast out demons. That's not what James is saying. We just got to submit our ways to God, submit yeah. our lives to God, and then resist by standing against him. And yeah, this is how we do it. Mm. Let's go on to verse eight. Then he goes on and he says, come near to God, or another translation says, draw near mm-hmm. to God and he will draw near to you. What is this, Dr. John? Quid pro quo? You give him a little bit, he gives you a little bit. What is this getting at? This idea of drawing near, coming near to God, and he will come near to you. What is that? I immediately think of the the story that Jesus told about the prodigal son, Mm -hmm. uh, where he's kind of coming back to God. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, the, the figure there of the father, yes. he isn't kind of sit, sitting back in, in judgment there saying, oh, you know, what have you done wrong type of thing. Mm. He rushes out to meet mm-hmm. him. Yes. And and I think that's just such a, a powerful picture of, of, of God. Mm. And I think that's probably maybe what, G, what James has in mind, mm. this idea Very good. That, mm. um, that God is wanting mm. so much mm. to have a relationship with us. He loves mm. us uh, and he, he will do everything he can can and has done everything he can to make that possible mm-hmm. um, and I think you know come near to God he will come near to you he's, 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 you know, he's not it's not as though he's distant no. he's, he's, he's there you know. it's it fits with the language of surrender and submission mm-hmm. as well verse 8 come near to God is James saying listen God is not going to force mm-hmm. you to submit to him right yep. mm-hmm. You must submit to him. Mm. It is a, it is an act of choice mm. on your part and on my part. Mm. Come near to God, and as you submit to him, he will absolutely come near to you, mm. and he will protect. I think the idea of coming near to mm. you is 
speaks to me of protection, mm. which would make sense as well, given, you know, resist the devil, he will flee from you. You mm. come, you submit to God, you, mm. you intentionally do that in mm. your life. You don't submit to the world's system. Again, uh, that's a reference to the previous verses that we talked yeah. about in the previous uh, study. But you are submitting to God, coming near willingly, mm. and he will come near to you. And then he goes on to say, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Mm -hmm. Now, he has talked, of course, James famously about double-mindedness. I think it's maybe James, is James 1 or James 2? James James where James 1, where he talks about a double-minded person is unstable in all their, mm -hmm. all their ways. In other words, they can't make up their mind what they're going to do. And he's obviously talking there about faith. He's saying um, he's, he's really seeking clarity from the believers. Mm. Recognize sin for what it is and mm -hmm. get your hands washed. Yep. Wash your hands, you sinners. Mm. Mm. And by the way, he's talking to God's people here. Yep. He's not yeah. talking to people who are not Christians. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's talking to God's people. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Make a comment or two on that, Fraser. Yeah, I think James is like, sin's serious stuff. It's not, you know, sin means to, to miss the mark. It's an archery term. Mm -hmm. And you miss it by a little, miss it by a lot. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're all fully justified by, by Jesus. But then to go back to our sin in such a, you know, the, the words laughter, I know we'll get onto that in a moment, but laughter and joy, it shows like how almost frivolous people were treated this friendship with the world, this that we spoke about in previous um, episodes, the, the, the sinful nature people, it wasn't like they, they, oh, it wasn't like, oh, a little mistake. It was like, oh my, like they were loving it, treating it like frivolously, like, oh, it's joyful. Haha. <laughs> Who cares about this? No, no. God cares about this. That's yeah. why Jesus had to die. Like there was a severe price that had to be paid for that. Right. So we should not treat it lightly. And that's what James is getting at. We should not treat this stuff lightly at all. Mm. Uh, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Mm. And then he goes on in verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Mm. Mm. Change your laughter to mourning and your, your joy to gloom. Why? Why would there be um, an imploration to grieve and mourn and wail and stop laughing? and stop being joyful, mm. why would James say this? Yeah, I think this just follows on from what Pastor Fraser was saying about actually, this is this is serious stuff. Like this is what Jesus died for. Um, and the concern is st still there in James 1, 27. James says that religion, you know, um, a, a life of faith, we might say that God accepts as pure is to look after orphans and widows and keep yourselves unpolluted from mm. the world. Actually, this sin stuff, it, it does matter what we do. And James is saying that, like, what, you're going back to your sin with laughter and joy? Like, no, like, that is not God's will mm. for your life. He's saying, come on, take this seriously. Repent is basically mm. what he's saying. Turn around, recognize what you're doing is, is not good. It, it grieves the heart of God. Turn around and come back to God. Mm -hmm. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. And if I can add to that as well, the word there for sinner, it, it means a hardened sinner. It's not like someone who's just made a little mistake. This is the someone whose sin is obvious, notorious, and they are loving it. And these words lament, mourn, and weep, they're, you know, words that have been used in the Old Testament many times. And of course, James is writing primarily to a Jewish audience here. Um, so, so these words will definitely kind of be hitting home very, very hard mm. and lead into what Pastor Jonah said, oh, to, to, to repent and come back to God with everything that they are. So, yeah. Mm. And grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. And again, important to bear in mind, and it is a sobering reflection. He is talking to God's people here. Mm, yeah. He's talking to a church here, mm, actually. Right. He's talking wow. to a church that has essentially allowed worldliness to infiltrate. Mm. So that the you know what it's really meant to be about, yeah. faith and serving one another, has actually become a sort of a capitalistic venture mm. oh. for you know people who can see that they could get decent employees from this, and mm. uh, you know they can earn a quick buck from this, and so on. Yeah. James is having none of it, mm. so this is the reason I think why James mm. speaks with such strong language in verse 9. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Mm. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, this you've missed the mark. Mm. This is not the church that Jesus died for. This right. was not how he envisaged it. This mm. is the polar opposite. And sin does have serious consequences, yeah. doesn't it? And of course, yep. that manifests in carnality and quarreling, infighting, and so on, of which, of course, all was going on mm. uh, here at the churches that James is addressing, hence the reason why he addresses that at the beginning of James chapter 4 as well. Any, any more comments on this, Dr. John? 
I think it's interesting the, the words wash your hands. As, as uh, Pastor Fraser was saying, it's a Jewish audience. Right. They were being very familiar with this symbolic washing. Right. Uh, yes. Thinking back to the mm. temple as the big huge. The ceremonial thing. washing. Mm. Yeah, hands, so washing, yeah. washing hands um, symbolizes kind of cleansing. But then he goes on to say, purify your, your heart. Mm. And to me, I see a kind of uh, mm. contrast between the religious ceremony that they will be very familiar with. And he's saying, well, you know, it's not enough to you know, just wash the outside, mm. purify your heart. Yeah, so this good. is bringing in the teaching of Jesus. This is not just about your hands, folks, mm. James is saying. This is about your heart. Yeah. Yep. Mm. In other words, and it is a brilliant, again, this is the genius of a Bible study like this. When you understand he is writing to a Jewish audience, mm. they would have understood the language of washing your hands. And then James brilliantly, ingeniously mm. takes it a little further. Wash your hands, sure, purify your heart, because yeah. this is ultimately a heart issue, mm. uh, and it's, that's that's what he's talking about. Any comments to make on that? Yeah, I suppose where it talks about, you know, um, stop, you know, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. He's not talking about the joy of the Lord. He's not saying that Christians, mm. we should go around and be miserable all yeah. the time and everything. No. This is specifically to people who have, are essentially calling themselves Christians, but they're living in perpetual sin, and he's saying, recognize it for what it is, turn to God, you know, and that there's going to be a sense of conviction about that if, if it's done seriously. But then actually the, the the beauty of walking with God is that actually when we turn to God and we walk with him, he draws near to us. And then the fruits of the spirit that manifest are that love, joy, mm-hmm. peace, righteousness. And that is what the long-term manifestation of walking with God should look like. And then of course, verse 10 there, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Mm. So it's not about you lifting you up. Mm. In fact, if anything, you've just got to keep yourself down. Mm. And as you do that, he will lift you up. It's back to this message of pride versus humility that James has been going on and on and on about. Mm. He hits it again. Mm. What do you think, uh, what do you make of verse 10 there? Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. What lessons do you think we can learn from that? Oh, absolutely loads, especially um, lessons could we learn? There's absolutely loads, isn't there? I mean, humility is probably... A prerequisite. I mean, you, you have to recognize that you need God, don't you? Yeah. We have to have this recognition that we, we need God. It's always by his grace. It's always, um, he's the one who will ultimately lift us up as well. You know, on that, on that day when we pass or, or Jesus returns, like it's God that's going to do that. It's not my works. Mm. It's not any of this. And actually when I understand that I needed Jesus to die for me, oh, that keeps me humble. And yeah. I think it's constantly coming back to, to that verse, verse eight, come near to God and he'll come near to you. As you said, a different translation, draw near to God it's both an invitation and a promise isn't it and, and actually when I draw near to God that, that that's, that's humility because it's recognizing I need him mm. I don't want to draw near to the world I need to draw near to God and we can draw near to God in lots of different ways and these keep us under we can draw near in worship praise and prayer draw near by asking his counsel draw near by enjoying communion with him mm. draw near and ju- just in, in everything that we do mm. we draw near to God and the promises that he'll draw near to us it's, yeah. and drawing near is speaks of intimacy doesn't mm. it? it is an essentially an intimate mm. personal not private but personal, personal. Mm. relationship with god that must be profoundly developed it involves all those things that you just of mm. you've just mentioned there mm. plus a whole lot more mm. of course as well it talks about and that's the place where we humble ourselves isn't mm. it humbling ourselves is not a public act you don't you know you don't post a social media thing saying i'm i think next week i'm going to be more humble yeah <laughs> uh, so please pray for me as i am bark on this journey mm. and I'll do day one day do day <laughs> again it brings up the point and it's sort of a frivolous point in a way but it's kind of a serious point of James was suddenly transported back for a day or two and he came to see you know uh, how things are now yeah. I wonder how we'd fare if we got a letter from James yeah, wow. <laughs> um, let's move on thank you <laughs> but um, you know this idea of humility it is it is a, a, a it is to do with pr- personally yeah. <clears throat> submitting I remember an old pastor came to my church in Ireland many 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 years ago his name was Pastor Houlihan I just love that name Houlihan I thought he was like a you know tongues or whatever Mm-hmm. Pastor Hulan, and he stood up and he said, do you want to know this? I, I'll never forget this as a kid. He stood up in his strong Southern Irish accent. He said, do you want to know the secret of service? He said, well, the secret of service, he said, is secret service. Mm, wow. And then he said, I'll give you another one. The secret of prayer 
this secret prayer. And of course, that's what Jesus taught. He said, you know, he was rebuking the Pharisees yeah, yeah. and the, and the you know, when they were out in public, look how humble we are. Mm-hmm. Jesus said, you want a real prayer? You get into the closet, you shut yeah. the door and you seek God with all your heart. Mm-hmm. James, of course, would have been mindful of that. I think that perhaps is why he's writing like this. Mm-hmm. Humility yeah. is something that happens in the private place, in the yeah. personal mm-hmm. place with God. Mm-hmm. We humble our hearts. All of the nonsense that's going on here, he's saying it is shameful. We need to stop. Mm-hmm. It's not to God's house. We've missed the mark. We are called to be humble. And as we humble ourselves, God is the one who lifts us mm-hmm. up. Yeah. In other words, don't try and exalt yourself. Let God exalt you. Mm-hmm. And that's the best uh, yeah. way for it to happen. I think these verses are very, very powerful. And my word, they have things to say to us in the 21st century. That's James chapter 4, verses 7 to 10.